I'm going to introduce our speaker. So uh, Martha White is an associate professor of computer computing science at the University of Alberta and a PI of Amy. That's the Alberta Machine Intelligence Institute, one of the top machine learning centers in the world. Martha holds uh, um, uh, the Canada CIFAR AI chair. Uh, she's an associate editor of uh, the IEEE Transactions of Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence. And in 2020, she received the um, uh, I triple E's AI's uh, Tend to Watch award. Um, so um, I've, I've definitely been watching her exciting research. It's uh, uh, focused on uh, developing algorithms for agents continually learning on streams of data with an emphasis on representation learning and reinforcement learning. So please, everyone, uh, join me in welcoming Martha. Thank you very much for having me. I have put my slides in the chat here in case anyone wants to follow along as I'm telling you about them. Um, you know, this is a broad audience. I tried to make it accessible to everyone, but I really hope that you'll interrupt me and ask questions if you have any questions. And yes, I can paste it again. Um, <clears throat> and unfortunately, I actually was confused by time zones. Time zones are confusing. And so I scheduled something right after this. So we're gonna have to end exactly at noon and I'll have to leave. But I will try to leave enough time at the end for any discussion about these ideas. And like I said, please interrupt me at any time and clarify. Okay, this is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And whenever you want to talk about that, you know, you want to make sure that we're all on the same page for what the motivation are. So my main goal for this talk actually is the first one. I really want to motivate this problem setting up. So I want to motivate that general purpose agents need to learn many subtasks in parallel. Uh, it's not a big claim, but actually it's not necessarily what is typically done. So we'll, we'll spend a little time dwelling on it. Then I'm going to introduce what's called the continual subtask learning setting that lets us focus on developing agents that do, do this. And along the way, I'll point out what I think are really interesting research questions and also some progress that we have made towards those questions. Okay, so let's start with just a little bit of background in reinforcement learning. Um, okay, so my problem setting is reinforced learning, including for the setting where we're learning many subtasks. Uh, this setting is one where an agent interacts with an environment and learns from trial and error interaction. So it's in some state, let's imagine the agent here is trying to control this um, water treatment facility. So it needs to control things like pump speeds and so on, and it gets all the sensory information inputted as a vector S. Okay, so it's in some state S that currently is described by all the sensory information. It takes some action like changing pump speeds and it gets back a reward and also a next state that it's gonna be in. So it's gonna see this long stream of interaction and its goal is to learn a policy that's gonna maximize its expected return, which means that if it were to execute this policy, it would get the most cumulative reward into the future discounted by some gamma that is uh, less than one. Okay, so essentially it just wants to get as much reward as possible in the environment and the gamma tells it, you, it cares a little bit more about immediate reward than future reward but actions right now impact reward it gets into the future, so it needs to take that into account. Central to most reinforcement learning algorithms is, uh, is value estimation, which is exactly trying to estimate this expected return into the future. So value function VPI tells us an expected return from a state S if you were to follow policy pi. So what that means is from a state, um, you know, there's gonna be stochasticity in uh, the environment the agent is interacting with, so from a state, it wants to reason about, okay, if I were to run my policy from here, how much return would I get? But it's gonna see multiple possible trajectories of states and rewards. So it's gonna have multiple possible returns. So it wants to reason about the expected return it could receive from this policy. The nice thing about value functions is we can write them recursively in this way where it equals to the expected return, but that also equals the immediate reward plus gamma times the value in the next state. And so, Many algorithms are built on this recursion, which is called Bellman equation, where we're gonna use our own estimates to fill in parts of this return. Okay, and the other, uh, other value estimate that we'll need is an action value. So this value just tells us the value from a state. An action value says, if I was in a state and I took an action, then I were to follow my policy pi, what would be my expected return? Okay, and value fun action value functions are really important if we wanna actually improve our policy or learn our optimal policy. Because if we have this Q pi, we can always get back a better policy by acting greedily according to it. 
So just to make this a little bit more concrete, let's actually imagine what an algorithm would look like. That's an RL algorithm that's deployed on this system where it's controlling this water treatment facility. Okay, so let's imagine a SARSA agent. SARSA is a, a classic algorithm for control in RL. Okay, so it's gonna learn some action values, Q hat. And then, um, for example, it might use a softmax policy on Q hat that's gonna select actions proportionally to their value. So about high valued actions are gonna have higher probability, low valued actions are gonna have lower probability because it's proportional to this exponential on Q hat. Okay, so let's imagine that's what our policy is going to be. And, uh, and the interaction goes as follows. The agent's currently in a state, then it decides to take an action according to its current policy pi, then it's gonna to transition to a new state and see a reward, and then it's gonna preemptively pick what action it's gonna take in the next state because we're gonna use that in our update. Okay, and then it's gonna update its value estimates Q hat where it's gonna update towards an estimate of the return. So it's gonna, this is just like a regular linear regression update is mostly what this looks like, where this is my guess, my, my estimate of the expected return. This is a approximate sample of the return. And then, you know, I'm updating with the gradient of the function approximation part. Now we don't actually have a return. The return is this infinite thing into the future. So that's where that bootstrapping comes in. And um, so the return is that we're gonna use is the immediate reward plus gamma times our guess of what the return is in the next state. And that's just gonna give us an approximate return. And then there's lots known about how well these algorithms, um, when they converge, what their properties are and so on. Okay, that's my brief introduction to reinforcement learning. Um, if you have any questions, please do ask. But now we're gonna move on to the slightly more complex setting. And we're gonna ask ourselves, you know, how far can we actually get with these simpler model-free trial and error algorithms. Okay, my pitch today is that really we're going to need more if we want to move to what I call a lifelong learning setting or what's called the lifelong learning setting. Still a reinforced learning setting, the agent's still interacting with an environment in stays, taking actions, but now the things that characterize this setting are that we're going to have many steps of interaction and the environments could be potentially vast. So you can consider examples like you have an assistant agent that's interacting with people, you know, it's helping schedule things for them. It's doing this for many steps of interaction and seeing many different people. Or maybe you have a courier robot that's trying to navigate a city, or let's say you have this eco agent that's controlling energy usage for a network of buildings and that network of buildings is always growing and expanding. So these are, you know, vast environments with many steps of interaction. Just to be a little bit more precise, you know, let's think a little bit about what a courier agent might look like. Uh, in this lifelong learning setting. So if we were to imagine a little robot that was navigating a city and let's say dropping off different packages and letters, we would naturally think that this agent should be making many predictions about its world. So for example, might be making predictions like what will happen if I pick up this object or how many steps until I get to that door and how much longer can I drive before I need to recharge. Okay, these are all things that are beyond just what we saw with that SARSA update, which is reasoning just about getting an optimal policy. Okay, so this is the setting we wanna think about. And uh, before we keep thinking about it, I do wanna point out that lifelong learning to me is a very practical paradigm. So real world environments are complex and potentially vast, and they require the agent to run for a long time. So sometimes lifelong learning is seen as related to AGI. It's kind of this grandiose problem setting, but to me, it is the problem setting we need to be tackling if we actually wanna start deploying our agents in more complex environments. So for me, the motivation is very practical. Okay, so um, the claim now then is just like I showed you with that little courier robot that under a long sequence of interaction, our agents should accumulate knowledge about its environment because that knowledge is then gonna help it learn and adapt faster in particularly in new situations or maybe even under non-stationarity. Um, so if it's interacting in the world for many steps, it's worth spending some time learning about these pieces of knowledge about the environment so that you can then do better in the future. And so what we're going to do is try to encode this knowledge as subtasks. Subtasks are going to be these modular pieces of knowledge about the world that we can reuse. And the notion of reuse here is the key thing. And we're going to look at two specific types of subtasks that we focus on in my group. Um, the first one's called options or skills. These are control subtasks. And the second ones are called general value functions, which are prediction subtasks. So let me tell you what those subtasks are. Those are just jargon words right now. Uh, and then I'll, again, further motivate why we really want to have these subtasks. So it's kind of hard to talk about why we want subtasks until I tell you what subtasks really are. Okay, so let's think first about what, um, yeah, let's think first about what an option control subtask is. 
Okay, so let's a, a natural example here is that we might want to learn an option policy pie that navigates to the lab. So again, you have this courier robot, it needs to navigate to the lab where its charger is. Um, and so then it's going to need to do that often because it has to go back and plug in and recharge itself. So uh, the primary task here is still to maximize reward in the environment. The agent wants to deliver as many packages as possible, as efficiently as possible. That's its goal in life. But it's useful to learn this option policy as a subtask that's to navigate to the lab because it's just going to help it with this primary task. So, for example, it could repeatedly reuse this option either as a macro action, so it can actually execute this as a known skill or behavior. That's why sometimes options are called skills. And otherwise, even if it doesn't execute it, it can actually also use this option for planning. It can reason about, should I go to the lab now? Like, what's the utility of going to the lab? Or should I not go to the lab? So it gives uh, for both of these reasons. And, um, and we can learn these kinds of subtasks, learning an option policy with algorithms that we just talked about before, the algorithms like SARSA. Okay, let's also look at an example of a prediction subtask, these GVFs. Here, the, the agent is also going to, in addition to wanting to have these kinds of um, policies that tell it what things it can do in the environment, it also wants to be able to make predictions about long-term outcomes. So it might want to know, what's the probability I will successfully plug in if I run the navigate to lab option policy? So you know, ran this, it learned this option policy, but now it wants to know what's the probability of success. Um, another one it might want to know is say how many packages will I receive today, or would I bump if I drive forward. But let's think about how to encode those though. So the way we're going to encode those predictions is with this um, language called general value functions. It's called general value functions for the reason that they really are just value functions with minor generalizations where we can consider things beyond the reward. Any, we can consider any signal or cumulant that we're going to reason about. So let me tell you a, one example how we're going to encode this question that we're trying to answer. The agent's trying to make this prediction. What is the probability I will successfully plug in if I run the navigate to lab option policy? Pi lab, let's call it. Okay, and so the, the way that we're going to answer this question is by formalizing it as a value function. And we can do that by, instead of reasoning about a value function or reward that tells us expected return in the environment, we're going to ask what's my expected a cumulative discounted sum of a different signal that may not be my reward. So here we're going to call that a cumulant instead of a reward. Since we're not trying to maximize it, we are just trying to predict it. And the cumulant for this question would be the following. So it would say if I was in the state where I've successfully plugged in, my cumulant value is one, and otherwise it's going to be zero. And then we can think about what the semantics of this action value now means under this cumulant. So it's saying if I were to follow my policy pi lab, starting from a state and action, I'm going to accumulate all these cumulants, which are going to be zero all the way until I successfully plug in. So if I can always successfully plug in, this will always look like a bunch of zeros and then a one at the end. And this expectation is going to be one. But if sometimes I fail, you know, let's say something, something gets in my way, there's a um, traffic, traffic jam or something, maybe 30% of the time I fail. So 30% of the time this trajectory doesn't terminate with successful plugin and 70% of the time it does terminate with successful plugin. Well, then 70% of the time I see a one, 30% of the time I see a zero and expectation it tells me 0 0.7, which is exactly telling me the probability of successfully plugging in. Okay, so that's one example of a, a GVF. Let me give you one other one, just so you can see how these look a little different. Oh, um, all right. And actually, before I give you that other one, let me just say that we then, just like for option policies, these are straightforward to learn using all of the value function algorithms that we know and love. Mainly what's going to happen is we're just going to replace the part where we usually see the reward with now this cumulant. Um, and, you know, here I'm just showing you a slightly different update where when we're doing policy evaluation, which is here, we're just asking what would be the outcome under this given policy. We'll actually look at the actions taken under that policy. But otherwise, this is just, again, an estimate of return minus my guess of the return, and we're going to update uh, with that error. Okay, another example of a GVF might be, for example, how many packages will I receive today? That's a useful thing if, in order for the agent to decide what it's going to do at the beginning of the day. If we were to write this a little bit more in, in from the agent's perspective, it would be how many packages in total will I receive until the end of the day under my typical behavior pie? Okay, so the again here we can think of a cumulant that looks very similar. In fact, we're here we're going to say if S prime is that we receive a package, we're going to have one. Otherwise, it's going to be zero. And so now in each step, where we might we might receive a package, we might not. So we'll have a bunch of zeros and ones here. 
in total, that's going to sum up the number of packages we have where this return is going to be terminated when we reach a state that indicates we're at the end of the day. Okay, so again, this accumulation of these signals is just going to tell us what's the number of packages I expect to receive until the end of the day, you know, given my current state and the action I'm going to take. Okay, those are the types of predictions we'll want to encode with GVFs. Um, we can, of course, also encode simpler things that you might think would be useful for the agent to know. For example, one-step models can be very helpful for an agent to have. You might just might want to predict, in my current state, what might I expect are my sensor values going to be on the next step? That can actually easily be encoded with general value functions as well, simply by saying, I'm going to have zero horizon. I'm just going to look at the immediate next step and then terminate immediately. Uh, and, uh, and then, so it's just going to look at my expected cumulant C. And if we set that cumulant C to be the sensor value on the next step, then we're just going to be predicting the sensor value on the next step. So we can always do, you know, one step predictions, or we can do multiple longer horizons into the future by doing this accumulation into the future. Um, but I will point out that these can't represent all the possible predictive questions we might want to ask. For example, if we wanted to do time series style predictions, like what's going to happen in 10 steps or what will my her, um, sensor value be in 10 steps, like an end horizon prediction, that can't actually be represented by general value functions. Um, but nonetheless, we're gonna move forward with GVFs and options as the way we specify subtasks, primarily for two reasons. One is that it allows us to use value functions throughout the whole system. So it's kind of this elegant system where we use the same types of well-developed value function learning algorithms for behavior and for all of our subtasks. And still GVFs and options provide a, a sufficiently rich language to specify a large range of subtasks. So there's nice work out there about GVFs, trying, giving lots of examples about the types of predictions they can make. Now I can see Colby, you have you know turned your camera on. Maybe you have a question by, by any chance? No. Um... I, I don't, sorry. <laughs> okay, it's nice to have your camera on anyway. Okay. Okay, so the, that's the types of subtasks we're gonna look at. Hopefully it's clear how this is gonna be useful to the agent. You know, it's gonna have all these different option policies that tell it how to get to different parts of the world that might be useful and it can reuse those. And it's also gonna be able to make many different predictions about its world that effectively specify a model of the world. You know, based on current conditions, what do I expect to see into the future? Okay, so before moving on more to how are we actually gonna learn all these things, I think it is natural to step back and ask, okay, do we really need these? I said, should we just do model-free learning? No, I don't think we should for lifelong learning, but let's go back and, and ask ourselves, why is it that it's still pretty common not to learn these subtasks? It's not that you, it's not very common in RL right now to do a lot of work to go get options, learn them and actually use them. So most RL systems really still just use end-to-end -end learning of policies such as algorithms like SARSA or Q-learning. They don't learn any models, they don't have any options, they don't have any general value functions. And um, this is not a slight on our current methods, actually. It's really the case that for smaller environments that are stationary, where we can actually cover these environments well, like many of the problems we currently tackle, there really isn't much need to spend time learning these secondary objects for reuse into the future. So I think it's just very sensible to use SARSA in those cases. But as we start moving to more and more complex environments, um, I don't think it's too controversial that we need these secondary components that we're going to reuse, these subtasks. And uh, actually, arguably, it's just a very old idea in AI in general, the idea of learning multiple subtasks. And it's even an old idea in lifelong learning, where very early formalisms in lifelong learning, going back to Thrun, looked at learning subtasks sequentially. So you might also ask, you know, what's different now um, here from what was done before? So there is one, I think, critical difference about what we can do a little differently going into the future when it comes to learning all these subtasks. And that's the difference with of doing it sequentially or versus doing it in parallel. So for, for again, reasonable reasons, the tasks then were learned sequentially where, you know, first you learn to play tennis, then you might learn to play badminton. And the experimenter would actually design the sequence of tasks for the agent. And about what we'd really like to do is for the agent to learn many things about the world in parallel without having to do this sequencing. And so that raises uh, an important and interesting sub problem, which is now the agent has to decide for itself which subtask it's actually going to focus on and um, where to go in the environment to better learn these subtasks. Okay, go ahead, Colby. Now I actually have a question. Um, so when you talk about learning tasks um, sequentially, do you mean um, like 
learning them to completion um, sequentially. Um, like to might convert. be, or it might be at least learning them learning them well. So like, let's say you know that you want to learn option poly policy navigate to lab, then you might say, okay, agent, your current job is to figure out how to navigate to the lab. So it's going to spend its time trying to figure that out and learn that control policy reasonably well. And then it might move on to the next skill or option that it has to learn. Right. Okay, there's a question here in the chat. Let me just quickly read it. Okay, so the idea that we get different GVFs to guide the agent instead of relying on rewards that are difficult to tune to support multiple subtasks. The main idea is that the maximizing reward in the true in the full environment is this large complex environment is just a difficult problem. Maybe it's a sparse reward. You know, you only get rewards when you drop off a package, and in the in interim, you have to navigate this complex city. So that's a pretty sparse signal to try to maximize. Plus it's a big complex world. So the central idea is it's worth breaking up the problem into smaller sub problems or and, and more generally learning models of the world or predictions as subtasks and then using that knowledge to do a better job of maximizing reward. That's the central idea. I hope I answered your question, Katerina. Okay, so, the, in a, so this in parallel um, difference also causes an imp another important difference, which is that when you learn things sequentially, it's naturally on policy. And when you learn them in parallel, it really requires that we have good off policy algorithms that can reason counterfactually. So I'm going to just switch to this slide so you can start looking at it and I'll answer your question, Shivansu. Uh, okay, um, so I, it's still not clear to me how you are like, how is the agent learning both the subtask and the primary task? I see there are different Q functions for each of them, like, so are they like jointly optimized? And then yes, they also a, give their own actions. So how do you decide which action to take? Yep, that's a great question. And that's exactly the question that we're gonna have to try to answer. So it shouldn't be obvious how to do it. I'm gonna show you the, the small little formulas that we're gonna do. But anyway, it's not like it's actually that complicated. The idea is very natural. The agent's gonna be taking actions to maximize its environment reward. And at the same time, it's going to try to use all that experience with off policy learning to learn all these things in the background at the same time. That's I see. The, so the action space for uh, the 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 GVFs are not actually used for taking the action. It's the same as the primary task actions. You just use it to update them as well. The queues, queue functions for GVFs. Uh, right. Yeah, you're not taking actions from the policies associated with the GVF. You're just right. updating the values for those. Exactly. I see. Cool. Thank you. Okay. So the distinction between on policy versus off policy. Uh, the let me just tell you what that is with this example. So again, we can imagine this little courier bot is dropping off a package near its lab where its charging station is. And when it did that, it actually let's say discovered a new shortcut through a building. It should be able to use that experience to actually update its option policy, PyLab off policy counterfactually. So it's currently executing a different policy where it's dropping off this package. It's not actually going to its charging station, but you know, reasonably, it should be able to update off policy in the background using that same experience, the, uh, the policy that goes to the lab. It should be able to improve it and make it so that it takes a smaller number of steps to get to the lab. The on policy variant of this would say, I actually have to execute PyLab in order to update any information about its value. It's very limiting in that way. Okay, so of course we would like to be able to reason counterfactually where we share data experience across um, all many different policies if that data is pertinent to different policies. So it, uh, the on policy setting is very restrictive. The off policy setting is actually much more natural. It's probably how you would imagine agents would be learning. It's almost clearly how we're learning. We're always reasoning counterfactually. But somewhat unfortunately, many RL algorithms that were designed for the on policy setting actually have divergence and variance issues under the off policy setting. So uh, that's actually been an open problem for a long time, but I would argue that now we finally have the tools to actually properly explore this, learn many tax, subtasks in parallel setting because we have much, much better off policy algorithms. Even with just within just the last few years, we have really made significant progress on getting much better off policy algorithms. So it's sort of an exciting time where we've had the, we've known for a long time that we would like to learn multiple subtasks. It's a little too limiting to do it sequentially. We'd really like to learn them in parallel. 
And maybe a limiting factor has been the limitations in our off policy algorithms and that limiting factor is being removed. So we can whole, wholeheartedly explore this setting. Um, I'll answer your question in just one second, Dongju. Um, <clears throat> so what we're gonna do anyway is commit first to this inductive bias. So we are going to assume that and after I've given you quite a bit of motivation to spend some time on it, that the agent's gonna be able to learn more effectively in a complex world by learning and reusing these modular components that we're calling subtasks. So at this point, we're gonna go forth and say, we believe that this is important. We should build this into our agents. So it's gonna be an inductive bias in that way. And once we've assumed it's important, we'd like to learn options in GBS, we can ask two more specific questions. One is how is the agent gonna discover which subtasks are useful? You know, what predictions does it need to make? What option policies does it need to have? And then once it's discovered them, how is it going to actually learn these efficiently? All right, the first question, the discovery question is really interesting. Actually, Roy has worked on this problem as maybe some of you others of you here has also worked on it and will probably attest to the fact that it is a very difficult problem. So we're going to start off first by asking the question, assuming someone has handed me, the agent has done some discoveries, decided it really wants to learn these subtasks, How's it now going to do that efficiently? Okay, and that's where now we're going to get to this continual um, subtask learning setting. So first, let's look at what this lifelong learning RL agent has. It's still an RL agent. So this little gray box here is our agent. But now we're just more explicitly building in that we're assuming it's going to be learning these subtasks. So our RL agent is going to have to take action, so adapt its behavior with two purposes in mind now. It's both going to still want to maximize the environmental reward. That is ultimately its primary task but it also wants to make sure it's learning these subtasks well. So it needs to go get the data to learn those well because it's gonna use those subtasks tasks to actually maximize reward. So if it decided the subtasks are important, presumably it wants to learn them well as well. So the intrinsic reward is gonna, here is gonna reflect how much are the actions actually helping each of these subtasks learn? So how much did the new data that was generated give some information gain for these subtasks? And now the agent's goal is gonna to be to maximize both this external reward, let's say plus this intrinsic reward. Okay, now I'm gonna answer your question, Dongju. Okay, if the action is continuous, um, how can we remove the effect of, um, okay, how can we remove the effect of merging policies? So here I, it is true that I'm not telling you how you're going to use these option policies. Let me repeat back the question I think you're asking. If you're gonna learn multiple option policies, um, how are we going to combine them together to produce the policy that we actually run? Maybe that's what you're asking. Here, I haven't told you exactly how we're going to run, use these options. You might actually choose to execute them. You might just use them in planning. You know, there's this thing called Dyna plus options. Uh, and so for now, I, you're right. If it's unclear how you use them, it's because I haven't told you how you, we're going to use them. We're sort of starting off by saying we know the agent's going to need to learn these subtasks. And let's focus on the question of how can we learn them efficiently. You're welcome. Yeah, so for the agent right now, we're gonna assume that it, if it's decided it wants to learn all N of these subtasks, we're gonna rate them all as equally important. So we're not gonna say task one is more important than task N, but absolutely when it does discovery, it could decide task one is more important than task N and you could add in extra weightings here to incorporate that information. Simone, if that was uh, your question. Okay, so this is our problem setting. We'd like to maximize both um, intrinsic reward and external reward. Uh, but now even this is going to be a little bit too complicated. So I told you we're not going to do discovery. We're just going to focus on being efficiently learning these subtasks. But even that is going to be more difficult because uh, now we need to ask how are we going to balance extrinsic and intrinsic reward and uh, additional interactions are going to occur. So we're going to pare it down even just a little bit more. And we're going to ask first how we're going to develop algorithms just to focus on learning, uh, which is a question we haven't spent that much time looking at. So we just want to know what kind of algorithm is going to direct behavior, go actively gather data so that it's going to maximize intrinsic reward. Okay, that's what's going to be our continual subtask learning set. There's going to be no reward from the environment and the agent's goal is to efficiently learn these subtasks. So essentially it's going to focus on just maximizing this intrinsic reward where the intrinsic reward is the sum of signals from each of these tasks that say, thanks for that data, it was good or that data wasn't very helpful to me. And the technical challenges for this problem setting are that we need to think of good algorithms for the subtasks. That's going to be part of efficiency. The intrinsic reward specification is going to be important. 
And of course, the algorithm for the behavior is going to be important. So sort of these three things are the key technical challenges for the continual subtask learning setting. Okay, so let's, let's just to make this a bit con more concrete, we're going to consider a small experiment in a bandit setting about what this system could look like. And it's actually from a larger journal paper, more generally surveying many different intrinsic rewards. Actually, we wanted to understand what are good intrinsic rewards for our RL agents. We started in the RL setting. There were so many interactions in the system, it was hard to follow. So we actually paired back to the bandit setting and we got lots of nice insights there. So if you're, if you're interested in that, you can go look at this paper. But we'll just, I'll just pick out one experiment to highlight what this problem setting looks like. So since it's a bandit, we're gonna, there's gonna be no context or state. The agents are just gonna be seeing a signal not conditioned on any information. Let's imagine here that we have four subtask learners. So N is gonna be four and each of them is gonna have a different target that they're trying to predict. So one of them is gonna have a constant target, very easy to predict. On every step, it just sees exactly the same constant all the time. There's gonna be two high variance targets, which means they have, again, a constant mean, but they get a very noisy sample of that. So the Ys are gonna be a noisy sample. And then we're gonna imagine we have this non-stationary drifting target um, that you know, drifts in this way, changes with time. Okay, and, and the point of this experiment is to see what um, can the behavior actually balance the needs of all of these learners. So it needs to take actions. Each action corresponds to generating data for one of our subtasks. And now it needs to make sure that it, it selects those four actions so that all the learners are getting the data that they need. Hopefully the problem setting is clear. And the update is just gonna be a, a basic least mean square update, like a linear regression update. And there's no context, so there's nothing out here. Marta, can I ask a question here? Yes. Uh, so I'm just curious to know, maybe it's a random question. Uh, what is the application for this problem? Like if you think about it. Yes, the application of not this bandit problem because there would be none, but you mean maybe of this continual subtask learning setting in general. Is that what you mean? Uh, so there is no specific uh, application for this uh, yeah, the small bandit uh, right. experiment. No, the, the only, I mean, it's possible, it's always possible that bandits actually have ex, uh, have applications. But for us, it was only for us to understand the algorithm. So it's a scientific experiment for us to understand, and, and it's not going to give us an application. Uh, okay. but, the, but the insights here do help us then bring those insights to the RL setting where, you know, hopefully we will have applications. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so this is a conceptual exercise, not a real application by any means. And already here, surprisingly, things are hard. Um, <clears throat> okay, so let's let's continue. Are we, and so in this conceptual exercise, we can ask what's an example of good behavior? And what we should expect to see is something like this. So the behavior, there's a single behavior policy. It has to learn all these four subtasks in parallel, but it only gets to choose one action on each time step. So what you would expect to see is that in the beginning, it needs to select all of the actions somewhat equally so that all the subtask learners get some data. But the constant is really easy to learn. So as you know, pretty quickly it should decrease and it should stop selecting the arm that gives data to the constant subtask because it's already been perfectly learned. The noisy arms or the noisy subtasks targets are take longer to learn because that stochasticity makes it just harder to learn, right? You need more samples when you have stochasticity. And the drifting um, target is constantly changing. So you, you constantly need data for that one. So eventually the behavior should focus solely on get, generating data for that drifting arm. Okay, so this is why this is a nice conceptual exercise because it's clear what the ideal behavior should be. Uh, and then you know we can see what actually happens when we run some, some basic algorithms on this. Go ahead, Shimansu. Okay, so um, you say that each action generates data. How, like, how, what is the relation between the, the data that is generated and the reward that is obtained? Because presumably like green has lower reward, so it should be like, its probability should get lower if the agent is maximizing reward, but it doesn't seem to be doing that. So there must be something different between the two. Right, so we're not maximizing the signals themselves, we're maximizing how well do the subtask learners learn. So we're gonna maximize intrinsic reward. Now let me tell you what those intrinsic rewards are and then maybe it'll clear that up. So we're okay. gonna look at two different intrinsic rewards and two different subtask learners and see how uh, what happens. So two possible intrinsic rewards are one that's been very common, although it has known problems, but it is the squared prediction error that says, did the data that I give you change your predictions a lot? So like bigger error is good here. It seems strange, but bigger error here is indicating that you maybe learned a lot from that data point. 
Okay, so that's what the squared prediction error is. And then another intrinsic reward we might use is something somewhat similar that says, how much did your weights change? So if your weights changed a lot, presumably that experience that I gave you, the data that was generated under the behavior was very helpful for you to change your weights. So then thus hopefully make some kind of learning progress. So sometimes this is called like an amount of learning. This is all not formal. You know, this is a little bit of a, an imprecise description of this setting. So here the square prediction error, of course, has a, a problem though, that it, this part includes something that re relates to amount of learning. It looks at what are my current weights and compares it to the true expected value. That's what it's trying to predict. So that tells you how much it actually learned. Whereas here we have just this extra stochasticity that you know square prediction error can be high just because you have lots of stochasticity. So this is not a particularly good intrinsic reward and this is a much better intrinsic reward. Go ahead, Colby. Is the square prediction error, um... What are those values? The, are those like probability? Is that a, like part of a probability distribution or are they samples? They're like just action? samples. Yeah. So in every step, the agent's going to take an action. It's going to get a target from one of these four signals. Let's just, let's pretend it chose to take action one, which corresponded to a no, the, one of the noisy targets. It's going to generate, a, it's going to sample a noisy target. And then it's going to be given to that subtask learner. So it's going to learn with this and the agent's going to receive, the behavior agent's going to receive a reward that corresponds to um, this. Okay, cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, okay, I can see how this setting needed maybe a little bit more description. Um, it was mainly just a way for me to give you a brief thing, but we're going to run out of time. So I'm just going to tell you too, briefly too what these two subtask learners are going to be. So I already told you what that update was. It was this least mean squares update. And again, like we have a good, a reasonable intrinsic reward and a bad intrinsic reward, we'll have a somewhat bad subtask learner with a fixed step size and a, a subtask learner with an adaptive step size. Okay, and um, at the this is supposed to be simulating two realistic types of learners. So uh, once we move to the more complex setting, not just the bandit setting, we could imagine we, we might have very carefully specified learners that modulate learning down to be a robust to noise, things like Bayesian learners or algorithms that you know, are actual batch algorithms or very carefully try to get to convergence. That's being represented by these adaptive step size algorithms. And the fixed step size is an algorithm that's gonna be chasing noise. It's gonna be much less sample efficient so a fixed step size isn't a very sensible algorithm to use, but in our bandit setting, it's representing that class of algorithms, ones that are not really reducing their um, learning once learning is done and they're not robust to noise. Okay, so the main, main takeaway here anyway is that even if you were to take a good learner separately or a good intrinsic reward separately, there's all these interactions in the system that cause bad behavior and the combination of the two is important. So interactions between these two components really matter a lot. So for example, if we use squared prediction error and a fixed step size, um, the agent gets a, a really high error on the stricter target because it's not selecting enough because it gets focused too much on the noisy targets. And all these other um, cross combinations also have problems. So even if you use an adaptive step size algorithm, but we have squared prediction error, Again, it's, being, it's going to be chasing the noise from our noisy targets, and so it's not going to perform very well. The behavior will chase that. And the only uh, choice that's working well is looking at auto with weight change. And if we actually looked at what kinds of, what does the behavior actually look like across different runs, all of them have very strange behavior, except for this combination where we carefully uh, control both of these. Okay, so um, key takeaway, sometimes obvious, but often very hard earned whenever you go through a lot of these experiment, uh, experiments is that there's quite a lot of interactions between learning components. So once we start thinking about internal to an agent, we're going to have to pick intrinsic rewards, subtask learners, and a behavior policy. Um, interactions between each of these comp components with different time scales and so on can cause very unexpected behavior and failure. So we have to be pretty careful about how we design each component so that they interface well together. For this problem setting in the bandit setting, we really needed subtask learners that actually modulated their learning down so they weren't distracted by this noise. And we needed intrinsic rewards that are based on amount of learning and didn't have this extra stochasticity term. I'll point out that there's a, an interesting open challenge here where more generally, it would be good to characterize what are ideal subtask learners and intrinsic rewards. So in this paper, we go and explain why actually the best choice for both of these would be to use information gain, which is also called Bayesian surprise with Bayesian subtask learners. That is the right choice, but it is too expensive. 
So we show some connection between weight change and MAP subtest learners, which is like a reasonable compromise. But I think much more needs to be done here to actually understand what is the idealized or practical thing we could do, and then how are we going to approximate that? Okay, so we're, like I said, going to run out of time, but let me just answer Dongju's question here. So when using MSC error like that, how can we assume each subtask reward has Gaussian distribution? Um, I, I'm going to agree with you. We can't assume it has a Gaussian distribution, and the squared prediction error is a bad intrinsic reward, and we shouldn't use it. So you're right. In fact, one of, my, one of the things we learned from this paper, after trying 11 different types of intrinsic rewards, is that many of them are not very good. And uh, in fact, something as simple like weight change, which is just a very simple idea, but surprisingly not used before, uh, was actually very effective. OK, let's come back to the RL say. OK, so well, like I said, one of the key technical challenges was to identify intrinsic rewards so that we're going to get efficient learning. We're going to declare success on that for now. Of course, much more needs to be done there. But we're going to, when we move back to RL, we're going to just use weight change. And we're going to make sure we keep this lesson in mind where we work hard to have sample efficient R algorithms, you know, that carefully adapt step sizes or robust to noise and so on. Okay, now we're going to ask, look at these two other questions. One was about how are we going to get efficient subtask learners and how are we going to deal with the behavior policy? So I haven't talked to you about that yet, but um, the behavior policy, the intrinsic rewards are inherently going to be non-stationary. And that's because they're, they're related to the internal learning progress of the actual agent. If you're in a state and you take an action and you generate data, all of your subtask learners are gonna learn so that the next time you come to that state and take exactly that same action, your intrinsic reward is gonna be different because it should be different. Your subtask learners have already learned from that, um, from that transition. Okay, so inherently the intrinsic rewards are gonna be non-stationary, but our RL algorithms are designed for stationary rewards. So these are our next two technical challenges. As you might guess, there's no way I can do both. So I'm just gonna point you to this paper about off-policy algorithms. It would be a whole talk just to talk about off-policy algorithms. My lab has focused a lot on this question, maybe the most important question in my group. And I recently have a journal submission that summarizes this work and also the larger literature because there's just been a lot of work, like I said. And, and um, I think we actually are starting to get some definitive answers. So I encourage you to go look at this paper if you're interested in off-policy learning. And the key takeaway is that we've made lots of progress. We have some good algorithms. And as always with algorithms, the remaining open challenge is we can always make these better. So it's always important to continue improving sample efficiency and understand convergence rates. So I'm going to put off policy learning to the side, and we're going to focus on the second question these last um, 10, 10 or so minutes that we have. OK, so we, we have a recent paper in NERFS, just this last NERFS, called Continual Auxiliary Task Learning. Uh, we used to call them auxiliary tasks. Now we decided to call them subtasks. So it really is this exact same problem setting. And uh, the focus of this paper is how are we going to handle non-stationarity and the rewards? And the key idea for this work is using this thing called successor features that are going to help us learn the stationary components separately and then track the faster changing reward part also separately. But although also before I move on, uh, maybe I should be a little bit more clear about why it is that we have non-stationarity and intrinsic rewards. Um, I'm realizing now I don't actually have an explicit slide on that. Does anyone, does anyone have a question about why it is that we have non-stationary rewards in this setting? Kind of explain it a lot. I'm going to keep going. And if anyone has that question, I hope that you ask it. But inherently, we actually kind of expect that we have decaying intrinsic rewards. It's actually been tackled in a setting in bandits called rotting bandits. But we should expect that as time passes, if we really learn everything about our reward, our intrinsic rewards might actually start going away until maybe we add new subtasks and we don't know those well, and maybe our intrinsic rewards bump up back up again. But um, it's not just that, yeah, so we have non station rewards, and in fact, we have a structure to our non stationary. We expect it to largely be decaying. Okay, so um, anyway, in that setting, we're gonna imagine we have non stationary rewards. Now, how are we gonna tackle that problem? Okay, so to do that, like I said, we're going to use successor features. Successor features are pretty neat. So if you've never seen them, uh, this is just independently maybe useful for you to, to see successor features. So we're going to imagine that we have a feature vector X SA for a state action pair SA. And the successor features, um, everything ends up being value functions, are the cumulative discounted sum of the features when we follow policy pi. Okay, so this that's a bit of a mouthful, but what all this is saying is I have my feature vector on time step T. Then I have plus gamma times a feature vector on the next time step, plus gamma squared times feature vector on the next time step. And so it's just this cumulative sum of feature vectors into the future. 
you can see how this looks just like a value function. And really it is a value function. It's just, it's a vector value function though. So, cause you know, you're accumulating entire feature vectors into the future. But because it is a value function, once again, we get to use all of the same value function learning approaches. And that is what's commonly used to learn successor features. You know, you use temporal difference learning or SARSA-like algorithms to, to learn these. Okay, so that's that's what they are. They're just the cumulative kind of sum of features into the future. And now we can ask why is that at all useful? So if the rewards are linear in the features, let's imagine we have some true W star. We have some sufficiently rich features, maybe even learned with a neural network separately, or you've managed to specify a good set of features. And now the true reward function is a linear function of those features. Then the neat thing is that for a given policy, the action values can be immediately obtained just by using the successor features dot producted with these weights. So to see why that's the case, I'm just gonna remind you here that we're making this assumption. When we take this dot product, well, the, this is just plugging in the definition of our successor features, the cumulative sum, discounted sum of all the features, the weights come inside this sum. And now we're going to have a dot product that's the first term that's going to be rewards dot product in the second term that's going to be rewards in the next state and so on and you can see this is exactly the definition of the value function so this is the action values under our policy pi that's it that's how how does the successor features work it's, it's not a very complicated um, illustration so now again back to why they're useful and so you can see why this is the case that if i had the successor features then I could just dot product with W star to immediately get the action values. So what that means practically is that we only need to solve this much simpler regression problem. We just need to go learn weights that predict our immediate reward from our features. And then we can immediately use those weights to get our action value estimate. So that's pretty cool. That's, that's why successor features are beloved. But maybe you're sitting there and thinking, well, that's cheating. That seems worse, actually, because we've really exchanged the easier problem of directly estimating q pi, and, you know, which is a value function, with another value function, but it's a vector value function even. So it has to output this vector that's the same size of x, and we still have to learn this large value function. So what has really been gained here? And so the answer is that it isn't, it isn't a good idea to learn successor features all the time. It's again a when question. When is it useful to learn successor features? And it's only going to be useful, that effort is only going to be useful if we can have some notion of reuse. Same, same thing comes up. Okay, so for us, we're going to have reuse, in fact. As so successor features are going to be useful for us because our rewards are non-stationary. So we're going to be constantly reusing these successor features. And the idea here is that it's easier to track these slower, slowly changing rewards than it is to track, track a changing value function. So we can imagine that the rewards, let's say we have some new R tilde that has changed a little bit. So this used to be W star. Now there's some new change to it, some epsilon change. If we were to think about how that changes the value function, it would look like the previous value function plus a bunch of changes in all the states going forward. So this should be a gamma times this and so on. So you're sort of accumulating all these changes into the future. And so there's a bigger change to the value function when there's a small change to the rewards. Okay, so for us, it's gonna be easier to, um, uh, that means for us, it's gonna be easier to learn these successor features separately. And then all we have to do is track a small change in the reward. And so the successor feature part stays stationary. The dynamics are not changing at all. For us, what's changing is the reward. Those are the things that are non-stationary. So it should be easy to track a slowly changing regression target than a value function changing target. And in the paper, actually we formalized this intuition and show that you can have a better convergence rate if you had an SF and you were estimating this W star than some of the known convergence rates for a TD based value estimation. Okay, so now what we're gonna, so that's the idea. We're gonna learn the successor features. We're gonna track these uh, non-stationary rewards using regression. And now let's actually test this idea out. So for the last few minutes, I'll just go through some experiments we did with this. And both our subtask learners and behavior learners are learning value functions. So actually we're gonna leverage successor features for both of them to deal with any non-stationary. Okay, so the question was asked before, how is this a practical setting in the, as an application? We're gonna again use a conceptual experiment, but it's gonna be now extended to the RL setting, but we're gonna you know, take a small step so that we can sort of see connections to what was seen before. Um, okay, so we're still gonna look at imagining we have cumulant signals 
that might look like constants that are easy. So those are representing easy things to predict, noisy signals that should technically be easy because we're just predicting a mean value here at the end, but now it's a return. So it accumulates through the whole state space. But in any case, it's, but it's a noisy signal. And then again, some kind of drifting target that's non-stationary that successor features will be useful for. But again, now we have an MDP. So the agent's gonna start in some start state. And from each of these points, it needs to be able to predict if I were to be in this state, for example, and I were to take the option policy that leads me to this goal, um, what's my expected return? And the expected return is you're, you have a zero cumulant everywhere except for at the end. So it's like the bandit experiment, except for now we have this longer horizon of prediction. So it just adds in extra difficulties for learning. Okay, but we should expect somewhat similar um, behavior for our behavior where it focuses eventually on the drifting mostly and then uh, otherwise takes, stops looking at the constant faster. Okay, so the, the overall thing here is that we find the successor features improves performance for both the behavior and subtask learners. So let me just tell you what each of these lines are saying. Okay, this mu sarsa means that we run a sarsa, we use sarsa for the behavior policy and pi tb means we just use an off policy algorithm called tree backup. So this is our baseline strategy. And then if we say um, SR, that means we use a successor feature approach and GPI means we use successor features. So for those reasons why they are called these things. But so the first thing to notice, and in fact, sort of surprising to us when we first ran this is that tree backup is actually a pretty great sample efficient off policy algorithm. And, um, and we thought that for this relatively simple problem, these would work okay. But we, uh, once again, we're taught the lesson that interactions between these components is, is really important in these systems. And so this performs quite badly, actually. Uh, this algorithm just wasn't sample efficient enough, didn't handle the non-stationary in the awards well enough to actually do well on this problem. So we see then if we add um, at least successor features into the behavior policy to properly deal with this non-stationary rewards, we get some improvement. Uh, and then additionally, if we add it into both, then we really get the most stable performance. So that was pretty neat. Um, we have a few other experiments as well, where we looked now at what happens if we try to improve sample efficiency of each of the subtask learners. So here we did that by trying to incorporate some um, replay. Uh, in an effort to leave enough time for discussion, uh, I'll just sort of skip past this. You can go look at the paper if you'd like to, but uh, we, we saw that there was some benefits for carefully incorporating replay. And we also saw somewhat interestingly that incorporating some other ideas from off policy learning. So like I told you, off policy learning is becoming more mature. There's these neat ideas around these things called emphatic weightings and uh, another idea about interest functions that help focus function approximation. And incorporating those ideas here actually further helped improve the overall system, uh, which was nice. It sort of pointed again to the importance of making the subtask learners as effective as possible. Um, I'll, I'd like to point out one of the biggest limitations of the approach. So it was great. We really love the successor feature strategy, um, but we found in all of our experiments that the choice of the reward features themselves is very critical. So one thing you'll notice here is when we learn the successor features, um, we have to learn this this psi SA. So let's imagine you learn a big neural network, you're gonna input the states and the actions, and now you have to output a vector that's of the same size X SA. If you have you know, 10,000 features, you have to predict a vector that's of size 10,000. That's pretty expensive. So in general, for these features, you're gonna to want to be careful about making sure you have compact features. And then in addition, we sometimes found that if the reward features generalize too much, then it really can skew the value estimates. Um, so, so I think there's, in, for our own experiments, it was actually reasonably straightforward to design reasonably good reward features. Uh, and in general, when people use successor features, I think there's a big open question about how do you learn these reward features effectively. So to me, it's a, a limitation of the approach and also um, an interesting open challenge for successor features and for our problem setting as well. Yeah, so in our experiments, the uh, features X were either set to, you know, like basis features like tile coding features or RBF features, things like that, or we actually hand designed them to be reasonable features for predicting the reward so that we had that formula I told you, where reward is really a linear function of the features. So it, it is a little bit cheating. It goes back to being a conceptual experiment more than a practical application. Go ahead, Shivanshu. Yeah, so my question was actually going to be about that only, how, where are the features coming from? Are they learned or not? Since they are not learned, um, 
if they were to be learned, wouldn't it reduce to like the regular um, value function learning? Like assuming that you have a neural network, it's like the W is the last layers, uh, the parameters for the last layer, and then um, the features are the previous layers output. So isn't it akin to that only? The way in the, not exactly, the way you would learn them and the way I have seen them learned in other work is that you would learn, let's say you learn a neural network for your reward. Mm -hmm. And now the last layer is the new set of features for the reward, because you're then taking a linear function of that last layer to produce the reward. So presumably your neural network has been beautifully learned so that that last layer makes it so that you can perfectly fit the reward. And then you would use those features and you would hand them off to your successor features as the thing they're trying to predict. So it's sort of this two time scale thing going on. You're slowly learning your reward features. And on top mm -hmm. of that, you're learning the successor features on those reward features. I, so see. Okay. I see. Okay, cool. Okay, so let's uh, let's let me wrap this up now. So the main points of the of this talk were that general purpose agents, including ones that I think we're going to need for applications, require the system to be built with subtask learning in mind. Um, the continual subtask learning problem formalizes the problem of actually efficiently learning many of these subtasks in parallel and off policy, which is sort of the two key characteristics of the problem. And the key points to consider when you're actually designing these agents, if you were to go off and design these agents, is that it's really critical to have sample efficient subtask learners that actually can modulate their learning down and be robust to noise. And inherently in this problem, the rewards for the behavior are going to be non-stationary. And so that behavior algorithm should be designed to handle this non-stationarity. Uh, I'll conclude with a few uh, algorithmic insights. Um, one nice thing is that off policy, I've sort of already said this, but I'll say it again, off policy algorithms are now mature enough to help us move forward in uh, continual subtask learning. But as we see each improvement we added actually helped the whole overall system behave be better. So I believe that we can still have significant impact on all these complex, complex interactions we have by doing a better job of off policy learning. Successor features were a pretty neat way to handle non-stationary accumulants and rewards. And uh, somewhat surprisingly, weight change seems to be a pretty good intrinsic reward. And maybe it's the one that we should consider. Pretty bold statement, but nonetheless, weight change is pretty good. And finally, there's a lot more to do. So I already pointed out there's, we need better understanding of both theoretical connection between actually maximizing intrinsic reward and optimal learning of subtasks. Um, we need to understand how to get better subtask learners and behavior learners. We need to understand better how we're going to actually incorporate back environment reward, the external reward that we ignored in this work. Um, of course, it'd be great to actually apply these to applications and understand how useful is it there. And then, you know, we should learn how to do discovery and so on. So there's a lot more to do in this problem setting. I'll, I'll leave it there. And maybe we have time just for a couple more minutes of questions. We absolutely do. Let's uh, thank the speaker. Thank you, Martha. And thank you, everyone, for all your great questions. Great questions throughout. Any more? I'll ask the question. So, yeah, this is a really clever use of, of the successor features. Uh, one thing is that they can really be useful, definitely learn ones for adding more subtasks. Have you ever tried that? Have you considered that? That's a great idea. We haven't yet. But it's true that especially if you were to say for, you know, I have one option policy now, I've already learned the successor features for it. And now I would like to reason about different subtasks for that. Yeah, it would be a great way to reuse it, not just for on stationary. So no, we have not done it. Any other questions? I'll ask another one. Okay. So um, with the, all the fantastic work you've been doing on, on uh, off policy learning, this is sort of a hard case of off policy, right? Because you're not eventually going to get to the same distribution, you're really just offline almost, right? Is that not a problem in this case? Yeah, I totally agree that this is a really hard application of off policy learning. So actually it's kind of exciting in both directions. We've been developing all these off policy algorithms, but maybe we haven't been challenging them enough. So now when we bring them here, maybe we'll find that they fail in some ways. One way that it's really challenging is like you said, the distribution mismatch is gonna be really excessive. You know, this policy really wants to go that way and my current policy is going that way. And uh, how are we going to deal with the fact that there's, there's not that much overlap between these, these things? So I will say, though, that off-policy learning algorithms have been developed explicitly all about this distribution mismatch, because that's the reason they diverge in the first place. So a lot of the development has been around 
Okay, TD diverges if the distributions don't match. So what are we gonna do? One of the solutions is to correct the distribution. That's what these emphatic weightings do. And the other direction has been to look at gradient algorithms, which at least prevents divergence, but we still now have sample efficiency questions. Like we're always gonna have, what's my effective sample size under important sampling? And so that's, I think that's gonna be an inherent problem. One other thing that this problem setting at least helps a little bit with is if you were just had a passive data set, you may just never be able to learn something about one of your subtasks. So here the agent could say, I really need to learn this. I'm going to go get that data, which I think is kind of nice. So there's going to be lots of interactions again between these things. Yeah, it is, it is cool, very cool. Um, OK, I think we're out of time, but um, uh, great questions, everyone. Great talk. Thank you again. Let's thank uh, Martha again. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for listening to me and taking time out of your day. And feel free to email me more questions if you have any.